Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds, back again. Got my main man, Justin Ritchie. What's up, brother? What's up, man? How are you? I'm doing great. We're going to talk about why most inshore anglers fail in their very first and maybe second and maybe even third and maybe even fourth tournament. And this is coming from someone who's done a lot of tournaments. You, who's won a ton of tournaments, even went to what the Hobie world it's like going to the olympics for mm -hmm. for for kayak fishing and it it wasn't always easy for you though right like there you had some uh some pretty maybe was it embarrassing the right word or some just pitiful oh my gosh i it, i had to crawl at a snail's pace before i could run i have made so many mistakes if i could go back six seven years ago and just uh not necessarily like where to go and what to use and where the fish were but if I could just, you know, if I could go back and make some changes to how I approached being on the water, my mental state and my plan, um, I, I could have gone home with a lot more cash in my pocket and just been that much better. You know, I, I so there's there's a lot to unravel here. And I love talking about this. Um, it's cool. I'm, I'm ready, man. Yeah. And so in this podcast episode, we are going to talk about, you know, the best types of spots and, and even how long to fish those spots. That's a question mm -hmm. I know a lot of people ask is, all right, you know, it's tournament day. Like how long should I stay in a spot before, before I move? And, and uh, you know, in types of lures and just everything you could possibly imagine about the tactical side of things. But we're also going to talk about just the stuff in your head and even just like flat out mistakes that most people have no idea could even like disqualify you from a tournament. Cause that's the worst. And I've seen so many people, who actually like, I don't know if they get lucky or not. There's part of it is luck, but they have like an amazing first tournament and they get disqualified. Like they would have been in second, third place or very first tournament, even first sometimes. And they get disqualified because they didn't either go to the captain's meeting or they were barely there and just playing on their phone and just had no idea what just even some of the basic rules were. So before we get into that, do you mind kind of sharing uh, who you are? And some people obviously followed the last few podcasts know that Justin is now full-time here with Salt Strong. He is both a fishing coach. He's going to see him a lot in terms of being in front of the camera and offering advice because the dude knows how to fish. And number two, he's ahead of our tackle. So he's the guy in charge of going out and getting all the tackle that you see at fishstrong.com. And uh, a lot of really cool stuff coming uh, now that we have Justin uh, full time here doing all that. So what's the, the kind of what's the quick backstory and and when did you get into into tournament fishing and, and kind of the the overall results and uh, and you could tell some funny stories about the, who was it? The, it wasn't the, the Swedish. Who was it? Who was the, the group that you were kind of poking at last time? Oh, uh, the, the Aussies. The Aussies. The Oz, the Aussies. Oh man. Guys, if you're listening to this, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, you're hard or hardcore, but, uh, you know, I don't want to mean to leave you in the dust out there that day. <laughs> um, so, uh, born and raised here in Orlando, Florida, uh, fell into kayak fishing big time in college because it was in, uh, a, an economical way to get on the water and target everything. And I fell in love with the freedom that I had kayak fishing. I, I could just go out by myself and get a whole bunch of fish on the flats. I could drive all over Florida and launch anywhere that I wanted to that was, that was legal and I had access to. And I got into tournaments, I think, in, you know, shortly after college, a year or two after in 2011 or 2012. And um, was in a regular paddle kayak, competed in a few here and there, uh, and, and I didn't do so well. I mean, I, I knew how to catch redfish and, and big snook and trout and could figure out areas that I've had success in and kind of match it up with where I'm going to be launching and, you know, what the tides were. I tried to put all the math together, but it didn't seem to pan out. Um, it was right around 2014 when uh, I had a lot of big life changes. I, I started working out, was in the best shape of my life. I had a completely different mental state and I, and I went into things with a really, um, really detailed plan. I said, you know, if I'm gonna go into a tournament, I'm gonna give it 110% effort. I'm gonna plan ahead of time exactly where I'm gonna be, what I'm gonna use for how long. It was just this like, just this map. I mean, it was like a chaotic, you know, drawing board of all the things that went into my plan when going into a tournament. Um, and that was around the time that I got into a Hobie kayak. And that was a big strategic move for me from a tournament standpoint was in a regular paddle kayak, a lot of air during the tournament season, you've got a window in early spring, late winter time frame, which we're coming up. This is about the time that tournaments start, you know, ramping up, at least for, you know, for redfish tournaments inshore. And 
you're going to be fighting the wind. You're going to be fighting elements. You're going to have rain. I mean, tournament, a tournament wouldn't be a tournament unless the weather was garbage. It's just a, it's just how it goes. And a lot of times in a paddle kayak, whether you're heading back to the ramp or you're heading to a spot, you're fighting the elements and you're spending that much time and energy. Um, and it just wears you down mentally and physically. And I, I didn't want things getting in the way when I knew I had a way around it. And that was using a, a pedal driven kayak, a native or a Hobie. And I went with a Hobie because the fins would, you know, if you alternate the foot pedals, they'll go up flush underneath the kayak. So I could get in very, very shallow areas and still half flutter or half kick. Tony has talked about it before in other videos to still peruse along the flats and, and have my hands free to cast. So I spent half the energy pedaling against the elements. I could still have my hands free to make a cast because even in a 10 second window, that 10 second window could be you know worth thousands of dollars in a fish. I wanted everything um, to work for me and all of my tools be very specifically chosen to any tournament that I'm doing. And shortly after getting a Hobie kayak, and competing in uh, uh, my first tournament in a Hobie kayak was an IFA tournament in Punta Gorda. Um, and I got disqualified, which was super embarrassing. Uh, and that's kind of the first thing I'd like to jump into with everybody about what, why do people fail at tournaments? How does somebody go from, you know, I guess zero to hero or go from, you know, not placing at all to getting top three or even first place? And the biggest recommendation I have is to follow the rules of the tournament. I think it seems so simple. Yeah, it, it does. And when you're hyped up and you know, like, man, I, I got all this, I know where the fish are. I know what I'm going to use. Um, but I took for granted at the captain's meeting uh, a little detail for that particular tournament. You uh, were not supposed to share information via electronically. That means through text, through phone call, and even Facebook. And I put a post up of a nice like 29 or 30 inch red that I got before I went to weigh in and the tournament director saw it. Somebody had reported me and said, that's a violation of the rules. I have to disqualify you. I didn't say where I was or what I caught it on or any of the details, but it didn't matter. The rules are the rules are the rules and you have to abide by them. Um, it could, it would have it cost me fourth or fifth place in that tournament. And I, I still look back and think, man, you know, that's something that's part of the preparation, you know, rule that I, I just, it was an oversight on my part. Um, and so in this case, real quick, you couldn't even text like a friend, uh, a picture and Hey, here's what I caught before the weigh in. No, whether they were competing in it or not, I couldn't yeah. communicate with anybody during the tournament unless it was an emergency. And, you know, uh, a girlfriend or a family member calls you in the moment and it's an emergency. You can justify that, but anything else recreationally, during the tournament hours up until 3 p.m. at 301, it's saying do whatever you want. But up until that time, you know, there was a point it was very, very, they're very strict about it. And of course, so, if there's like a family emergency, you're probably not going to say, well, hey, you know what? I got something important to tell you. Let me tell you about this area where I just caught this monster redfish. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's totally different. <laughs> but um, uh, it's so horrible. The rules are big. And another one would be. Uh, measuring your catch. So in most tournaments, unlike, you know, there's a, there's like, you know, pro elite series, there's the boss man series where you actually get your two slot redfish and keep them in the live while you take them to the ramp. But most kayak tournaments, uh, all of kayak tournaments really are catch photo release. And in order to prove that you catch that fish the day of the tournament, you're given a token. And that token could be a, a chip, it can be a wristband, it can be a picture, it can be anything. But a lot of times you need to lay it very clearly on the fish or in the picture to prove that you caught that fish the day of the tournament. Um, and I know a lot of, excuse me, a lot of very skilled anglers that would have cleaned house with me if they had not lost their token the day of the tournament or the day before the tournament and they're panicking. I, a friend of mine, Wade Hollowell, uh, years ago, back in 2014, we did a tournament and in the first 45 minutes, he got a 30 inch trout. And we were like, oh my gosh, none of us are going to be like, we should just give up now. And we found out a couple minutes later that he was going back in his pictures just to make sure everything was right. And he goes, Oh no, I can't see my token in the shot. This fish is not going to count. And it didn't. And I actually won that tournament, <laughs> but, but it is super important to have your token, whatever that, that thing is very clearly. And sometimes the rules will even say it has to be on the fish or just has to be clear and visible in the picture. Um, so the token is big and measurements. 
Uh, you learn over time how to get the right angle to make sure you have the right measurement on your fish. Um, you, you know, sometimes a matter of a quarter of an inch and some tournaments measure up to half an inch or they round up to a solid inch or they'll go down to an eighth sometimes in championships, but a quarter of an inch difference and an angle of catching, you know, the photo of, of that fish on the bump board or the measuring device that you're using uh, is everything. A quarter of an inch can, can mean a difference between first and second place. So, you know, you always have to make sure that sometimes rules are explicit and say the, the head of the fish has to be up against the bump board at zero and the tail needs to be pinched or unpinched. And every little thing with those rules can make a difference on whether that fish even qualifies for that tournament. So please, please, please read the rules. Um, know them, you know, forwards and backwards the night before you launch or get out there and fish. And it may end up, you know, it may end up saving you in the, in the big run and protect the token like it's the most valuable thing on your person and right? it's like it's like showing up to the airport without your cell phone these days like what, what, what how, how am or, i supposed to find this person or a passport it's like going it's going to going to the airport going to flight internationally you're like oh i don't have my passport but that's fine right no it's not fine don't do that um yeah i put mine in a ziploc baggie that's the best way to go about it ziploc baggie that way if it does fly off it, you'll be able to catch it it's not going to sink it'll float away and it'll stay dry that's, that's been the easiest thing for me. It's inexpensive and, you know, it's quick. Cool. So what else? I'm guessing location is going to be an important one. Like, let's talk about that because a lot goes into that. You've got, I know some people who have the time to go pre-fish areas. Some people just have to spend a lot of time on, you know, on Google Maps and uh, doing a lot of time and research on a computer satellite maps what what what's your uh, feedback there in terms of where do, where do people go wrong when it comes to the all the pre-trip planning so that was the biggest grind for me when doing tournaments was trying to figure out where to go because you have eight hours in these tournaments and you'll often know by eight thirty or nine o'clock in the morning regardless of tide or conditions you'll know by nine o'clock whether you're going to do well or not based on what you've caught up at that point in time the first two three hours of the tournament are crucial after that, it's hail marrying, swinging for the fences and hoping you find a quality fish. But um, I, I would pre-fish a lot. I felt that that had a big, uh, it had a big effect on how I was going to do in the tournament by knowing ahead of time. Sometimes I would, I would take you know, three days or four days off of work the week leading up into the tournament and use my paid time off to go and scout areas in particular, in IFA tournaments, if it was a West Coast tournament, like the weigh-in would be in Ruskin, for example, you can fish anywhere on the West Coast of Florida. That could be the Panhandle, that could be all the way down to the Everglades. And with a catch footer release tournament, as long as you were back at the weigh-in by 3 p.m., you were safe. But that's so much area to fish, and the tides vary dramatically from Crystal River down to Fort Myers, that you really need to time all of the weather conditions your tides and just knowing whether there's fish there ahead of time before you even choose to fish in that tournament. And it's tough. It's a lot of road time. It's a lot of physical time on the water, but an everyday angler, you know, somebody that just goes out and fishes on the weekend can still go out in a tournament and do really well if they were to keep log of all of their catches over the different seasons and all their conditions. We have on the insider community, you know, taking note and log of where, when, all the conditions, what color lure, and just, just, notes on your success for the day um you know that time on the water and that experience makes a big difference in the moment even if you don't have a chance to pre-fish that's that's going to come in handy um but for me you know having those two or three days before the tournament to poke around at different launches and and time how long it would take for me to launch get to the area that the fish were on on different tides and then compensate on the day of the tournament is big um, I found that if I was going and swinging blind, uh, it was really 50, 50, either I completely strike out or I get lucky based on my previous experience in that area around that time. And, and we get a nice, you know, 30 inch red and like a 25 inch trout, get 55 inches combined between the two and, you know, take home first, but, um, location, 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 you know, it, it, we, we've said it many, many times, like you could have everything on you all the right lure and the right lure, the right leader, the right everything out there. But if you're not where the fish are, it's not going to make much of a difference. Um, one thing I'll point out that, that helps a lot in location uh, is actually it's networking. 
the people that you meet in tournaments for anybody that goes out and does their first tournament or anybody that's done a couple tournaments will say that it can be a little intimidating when you do it because you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm going up against all these other people. There's Tony Lai, there's Derek Engel, there's Eric Henson. There's all these people that are just veterans in the tournament scene and they're really, really good fishermen. But initially you might have this competitive nature about yourself to not communicate or not talk to the guy next to you or, you know, you feel like you have to keep all your secrets to yourself. When in actuality, the best thing you can do is to communicate with everyone, to make friends, whether it's for the, you know, the, the, whether you do well in that tournament or not, it's going to behoove you because anglers do rely on each other and communicate to help one another. Um, you know, in the 24 hours leading up to the tournament, you know, you might help a friend and say, hey, they're in this general area and you might have your own game plan, but Believe it or not, it's actually uh, counter, it's counterproductive to keep to yourself and not communicate with anyone. I have, I have been very fortunate to do well by having a good network and communication base of people that I touch base with to say, what were they biting on today? I might not say, where are you going? Because that's the secret sauce. You're not going to divulge that. Yep. But they might say, hey, I had a lot of good hits on topwater today. And then the day on, on pre-fishing, I might find out topwater is king. And I would not have known better if I didn't have that little tidbit of information. So your, your network of people you, you talk with help a lot. It, it, you know, it mean the difference between getting a bite and not getting a bite sometimes. Yeah. And that's, that's a big part of the insider community. You know, that, that was almost kind of an afterthought. We, we wanted a community that was all Facebook for a lot of reasons, but now like it, it's, it is a network, right. And not just for tournaments, but just for just maximizing your time to every day I see there's posts like on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Hey guys, I'm going out this weekend with my kids or my boss or coworker, or family in-laws. And I want to make sure we get them on some fish. What are you guys seeing? And to your point, it's not about like giving you a GPS spot. It's just like our smart fishing game plan video that we do every single Friday. It's talking about the trends. Like, Hey, here's the types of structure they've been on. Here's the types of depths that they've been on. Here's kind of the overall trend of what these redfish and snook and trout and flounder are doing. Uh, and it's incredibly helpful. I know CA Richardson, you know, he was one of our original fishing coaches and he always said that because he was a tournament guy for gosh, almost two decades. And he's like, it's all about the network. He's like, it's all about who, you know, and uh, Kevin Van Dam. And I, I remember that one article talking about how much money he spends out of his own pocket just to get people on certain lakes to give him intel, which I believe is legal to pay someone for intel. They just can't obviously be on your boat and stuff. And he would pay some of the local good old boys on some of these lakes that are out there every day, 10 grand in some cases I saw just to tell them what's going on. I mean, it's all about that network. It's just so any, true. anything to give them a, give them an edge. And obviously, you know, the tournaments that you're fishing and the ones we're talking about for inch or saltwater, not quite as big as the, the big boy bass tournaments where there's hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line and sometimes more. Uh, but still, you don't, you know, if you got a chance to win a thousand, two, what, what's, what's some of the big ones? 5,000? How big do they get now? 10? In the kayak world, uh, I think there's one coming up. I think it's the goat pygmy tournament in the panhandle. And I think that's 10 grand. It's a lot. And I think, I think there has been a 10 grand plus tournament on the the kayak bass side of things, the bass industry is, you know, starting to the wheel and deal in the kayak world. I think I don't quote me, but K, uh, KBF might've had one that was 20,000 or more. I mean, it's, cr it's crazy to see how far that's come over 10 years of, you know, making a note crate and a rod and going fishing to now it's tens of thousands of dollars in tournament and in, in tournament winnings. Um, but yeah, hiring a guide for an area that you're not familiar with is, is common practice leading up to the event. Um, guides are, there are some guides for each region and area that are willing to take you out and show you the ropes of just things to consider. Like if you had never fished Steen Hatchy before, it's a unique fishery. There's popping corks, there's miradines, there's a lot of people use gulp up there. Certain things work well on those fish in that, in that area. And certainly hiring a guide and a professional helps give you some tips to put in your back pocket the day of the tournament. Um, so, you know, I remember over in Amsterdam for the Hobie Worlds, the Aussies actually booked out uh, guides for two or three days uh, in the area because for that tournament you weren't allowed to fish on the body of water I think one month leading to the tournament wow. so so the Aussies had to anybody I mean there are people from Scotland and, and England that would hire guides in lakes surrounding that lake so that they could find a way to have an advantage come the tournament because it's a three-day tournament so I mean you're grinding for three days and uh, and they found out we all found out pretty quick that 
the water in Amsterdam is pretty dirty everywhere. And that's actually really good. Uh, Xander, which is like a type of walleye, it's their like mutant walleye. They get 40 inches plus. Um, and pike and perch, they get big over there. But having dirty water, those big pike are, uh, uh, they're a little less wary at striking at something if they can't see it. And the Finkenfein Plassen, which is where we were fishing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah. the Finkenfein Plassen, it's very, very clear. <laughs> we were fishing like 70, 80, 100 feet of water, like 100 yards from the shoreline, and it's crystal clear. So all that experience that these guys had fishing dirty water did not apply to the area that we were fishing, and nobody would have known because they weren't allowed to get onto it until the day of the tournament. So that was a, that was a unique case, but certainly if you you know wanted some information, uh, hiring a local guide, supporting supporting their business, and you know those tips will will help you the day of. Cool. So let's let's stay on this pre-trip planning part because it's so critical. When you're on, let's just say not the on the water fishing. This is the off the water fishing. Looking at satellite maps. How many different types of spots are, are you trying to pick? Um, is it three, five, a hundred? And are you trying to go for, you, you mentioned like throwing the Hail Mary, the, the, there's always that, all right, do I just want to get quality or do I want to get quantity and just know I can at least get one trout and one red or one snook or flounder, or whatever kind of term it is on the board. What, what's the mindset there? Cause a lot of that is stuff that's tough to teach, right? You go out there and try to get a, a record trout or snook or red or you just try to like man let's get something on the board and build from there so it's about numbers it's about total inches in the big scheme of things and um get you take into consideration the area that you're fishing i'll take the west coast for example because that's a lot of fun you've got tides uh as opposed to the east coast where if you know little honey holes in mosquito lagoon or the river or ponds to go into there's always big fish and it's you know they're just resident fish that never leave but on the west coast with tides and seasons Fish have fins and they're moving over the flats all the time. I would look at it like this. Um, if you know that the redfish are going to be in a general area and I try to make sure that I can get both species in the same area and that I don't have to go back to my car, load back up and go to a second spot in the tournament. The only time I would fish two different areas is if I knew from practice that I'm not going to find both fish in the same area. If you can kill two birds with one stone, you're in really good standing. And I would try to focus on, if I were to look at an aerial map um, to, to scout and pick an area, uh, I, I, and I'm going for trout, I find potholes. I find grassy, expansive flats with potholes. And uh, I need to figure out, okay, if I've got a lot of area to cover, um, I need to figure out my, my big search tools, what top water or big paddle tail. Guys, the five inch bomber, I mean, I think I've said it to you, Joe, and other guys, that five inch bomber, that color and that size is my number one favorite lure to cover the flats for big trout specifically. Um, that, I mean, that color, it, it, it matches with the color of the water. It looks like any big pilchard, you know, profile or, or a finger mullet of that size. It's money, you know, clear skies or cloudy conditions. That bomber, I think, is understated. And I really want to bring more attention to it because, you know, that color and then like a Houdini natural color were the two that I would throw. And I've done, I've won tournaments and I've gotten 22 to 25 inch trout in tournaments throwing that color and that profile when I need to have the wind in my back and cover up, you know, from nine o'clock to three o'clock, just cover the whole flats and hit those potholes and hit those little dips in the grass where there might be a prop scar and uh, top water lures and a five inch paddle tail like the bomber were key. And to be clear, this is the slam shady bomber, the five the inch slam, slam shady bomber. Yeah. The slam shady bomber. Do you like yeah. to rig it up on one of those weedless weighted hooks or are you doing a jig head? Uh, always weedless weighted for me. Um, a lot of my bigger trout are going to be over grass. And if you have an exposed jig head, you're just going to, every other cast, you're going to run the risk of getting snagged up on it. So, you know, I think the best pairing, if I, you know, whether I want to go slow or fast with the paddle tail, I think that the uh, the four aught eighth ounce owner weighted twist lock, or even the five aught eighth ounce, or even the five aught quarter ounce, you know, those four aught to five aught sizes where the money sizes to match with that bomber, you get a little bit. Uh, the hook goes back a little bit further on the plastic, so if you do get a trout to short strike, um, you're going to have a better chance of hooking up to him with a little bit longer uh, bit on that hook. And uh, eighth ounce to quarter ounce seem to be the size. I would prefer to stay with an eighth ounce um, weighted size for covering flats from 
three feet up to, you know, a foot. That's kind of the, the range of the flat that I'm looking for. But to answer your question, what am I looking for on, on Google Maps and, and uh, just like aerial overhead view of an area? Grass, potholes for trout. Those, those are the big things. Um, and if I'm going to go for bigger trout, I found that East Coast, West Coast, uh, if I want a trout over 20 inches, a lot of times I'm going to get shallower than you would think. I'm going to look for those bigger trout in areas that you would find those 27 inch, 30 inch redfish. Um, the bigger 20, 22 plus inch trout are going to be up in a pothole that's just a little bit shallower than those deeper three or maybe even four foot flats. But I always try to put fish on the board, just get fish on the board, get a, you know, the staple would be get a 20 inch trout or as close to a 20 inch trout as you can within the first one to two hours of, of daylight in that tournament. And then I would spend the rest of my day scoping out a couple different areas for redfish because once the sun got high, your big trout opportunity is going to, it's going to decrease. Cool. That, that was going to be one of my questions. Have you ever fished tournaments with uh, like the full slam where you got either a flounder or a snook is the third fish? Mm -hmm. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did, did you have the same mentality as, Hey, I want to go catch at least a trout first. Is that usually always it just to, it's the, kind of the easiest, if you will, in general or no? Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. I, I would say trout tend to be the pickiest throughout the day. I'm less likely to get a, uh, unless it's cold. I guess it's the only time that I would reconsider catching, you know, a bigger trout later on in the day is if it was cold and it's warming up and every, everything's going to bite a little bit better when that sun starts beating on the flats. But most situations in, in tournament season when it's blowing 10 to 15 and it's sunny or partly cloudy, uh, I try to get my big trout first and then I'll focus on snook and reds later. Um, most tournaments are, if you get a, a trio tournament where you got to get a slam, it's usually snook, red and trout. And snook, uh, you can get a big snook around structure uh, with shrimp presentations or soft plastic jerk baits worked really slowly in strike zone areas, you know, like docks and, and deeper oysters with little cuts and passes. If you take the time and you beat it up, um, those fish are holding tight to structure and they'll stay there. And sometimes you might need to present a lure, you know, 50 or 60 different times in the same area. Eventually, if you know that there's fish there, if you've caught fish there before, um, likely a snook, for example, is probably still going to be there. And eventually you're going to, you're going to frustrate it enough to where it's just going to swipe at it and be like, you know, I'm tired of looking at this thing. Um, snook do not like to be annoyed and, uh, just something to keep in mind. If you ever snook fish and you know, they're snook in an area, or if you see them and they don't get spooked and they don't leave, keep casting over and over and over and over, just annoy that fish. They're eventually out of instinct going to be like, get out of my face. And they're going to, they're going to eat it. And then you're going to, you're going to win the tournament. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, it's so true. And sometimes it's even just, I don't know if it's the, the right moment at the right tide, the right amount of water, certain amount of bait coming in, but I have that bridge. I've posted uh, exactly where this bridge is, as an insider report to our insider members. And I go fish it on foot. It's a bridge you can kind of walk to underneath and there's always snook there. I mean, you could literally, if you're up on top, you can see him down there and same deal. Like I sometimes it's right off the bat. And sometimes I have to make a hundred casts and all of a sudden it's like, boom. I'm like, thank goodness. Uh, that is <laughs> that is so true. Um, now the bass guys, we've all seen them. We kind of poke fun at them. And then they go out there in their tournaments and they have, I don't know, 18 rods, whatever the max amount of rods are allowed to have on their boat. And it's every lure you can possibly imagine, you know, crank baits, lipless plug and all that. I mean, it's just, it's on and on and on and on. What do you do? Obviously, if we're talking about kayak in particular, you can't have 18 rods. Um, are, are you, I guess the, the overall question is, what are, what's your focus? Is it, all right, I'm going to be a specialist. I know this is my confidence lure. I'm going to try to stick with as long as I can. Or are you like switching up uh, quickly? I take no more than four rods out there with me. If I, I think I said in another podcast, if I know exactly what I'm doing and I know like for sure, like the trout are going to be here, the reds are going to be here. I know what they're going to eat. I'll take three rods. It's going to be a top water. It's going to be a, a, a big paddle tail like the Slave Shady Bomber, or it's going to be a, a weedless soft plastic. Um, it could be a stick bait, could be like Alabama Leprechaun. It could be any, any sort of jerk bait profile uh, in either, you know, Slave Shady color or like a natural color, like blackish brown, watermelon red. Those are my three. Those are my three go-to. If I have a fourth with me, the fourth is going to be, a, it'll be a Hail Mary thing. Because I've already got two lures to cover expansive flats. I've got one lure that I know 
in sight fishing applications I've had the most success with, you know, a weedless jerk bait in natural color or white. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I think the fourth would might be like a Miradine, like a, like a, like a hard twitch bait in case I am working a, a, like my, the bomber or a cover the flats with a big paddle tail. If they don't want something moving and they want something that's going to hover and erratically sit in the strike zone, I'll try to find a, a suspending twitch bait like a mirror lure. Um, I think, you know, there's a Rapala. We have a, a mullet colored Rapala that's like a twitch and wrap um, that works really well. So the, usually four, and, and those are kind of my setups. Topwater, bomber style, five inch paddle tail, weedless, soft plastic, natural or slam shady colored jerk bait. And uh, the fourth is uh, suspending twitch bait. I think those right. are like my four go-to. So how often do you switch them up? Ooh, the, very planned in the first two hours of, of my tournament. And I'll kind of explain like everything's about a plan. It really is. The first two hours of the tournament, it's top water and, and bomber style, you know, five inch slam shady paddle tail. Uh, those are, those are my go-to it's get the trout on the board. And then, Hey, if I get a 30 inch red in, in before I get my trout, that happens sometimes those big reds might be just zigzagging across the open flats and they'll hit a top water and they'll hit a big paddle tail. Um, but I try to get my trout first thing in the morning. And those are my two presentations from about nine o'clock through the rest of the day, let's say nine to 12. I'm getting up shallow and I'm targeting redfish or big trout and I'm sight fishing with that one soft plastic weedless bait. Uh, that's pretty much what I'm going to have in my pocket tucked and ready to go at a moment's notice for any fish that I see. So that's kind of my arc. You know, if, if I don't do well and I've got a big trout, but I'm having a hard time finding a redfish in that last hour or two hours of the day, the sun's high, the wind's kicked up, the fish are spread out and they're not feeding as well as they were in the morning. It's about, you know, it's search and destroy. It is cover as much water as possible. Uh, maybe not with the top water, but slow rolling that bomber, that slam shady bomber, um, as slow as I can through the grass and through the potholes. And that is a, you know, just, just launch it and pray and hope that a big red picks it up. So that's kind of like the boom, boom, boom throughout the arc of the day, kind of what I'm, what I'm looking to do. Um, but like I said, if, if you've put in the time to pre-fish, if you have your network of people, if you've prepared what lures and what colors you're going to throw and, and plan of when you're going to go throughout it throughout the day, by about 8.30 or 9 o'clock, um, I'll know whether I have two really good fish in the boat and I'm sitting happy and then it's just about upgrading. Or if by 9 o'clock I'm struggling and I've got one fish or I've got no fish, um, I'm still going to stick to that same game plan because I feel that that's kind of been my route you know, for the past 10 or 12 tournaments, that's kind of the arc of how my day's gone, but you'll know pretty quick where you're sitting. <laughs> Speaking of sitting, how long are you sitting in a specific area? We talked about how often you're changing up the lures and, and does it depend, right? If, if you're in a place where you're just catching a lot of fish, do you, do you move? I know there's been plenty of people who've regretted that, right? Like, oh man, I should have just stayed there where the fish were and I got greedy and wanted to keep getting bigger fish. But what's, what's the story? So I had one tournament where I, if I would have won this tournament, I would have gone to the Hobie worlds again in 2015. And it was an area that I knew there was a giant school of redfish and uh, the locals in Tampa Bay, you'll, you probably know over time, the, the general haunts of where these big schools of a hundred plus big redfish will hang out in Tampa Bay. But in a tournament, uh, if, you, if you find it, you know, there's going to be 20 or 30 other boats on it, beating those redfish up, trying to get, you know, one or a couple fish for their clients. And I found them the day before the tournament. I could not get them to bite. I threw everything in the kitchen sink. I would like give all of my baits a procure bath or a scent bath, just, just hoping I could like, you know, gulp and everything, just dead stick a bait in front of the school of fish and hope and pray that one would pick it up. And it did not work out. And I told myself for the day of the tournament that, I can't sit in a spot that I know there's fish and they're not going to bite. And that was a mistake because the guy, there was another kayaker that came in from out of town. Uh, Joe Comiati came in and he knew where those fish were. And I didn't see him out there the day before. And I said, Hey man, I, I know they're there, but it's, a, it's tough. Like I, I wouldn't spend the day doing it. And he did. And he got one and he went to the Hobie world. So the whole leaving fish to find fish, you know, it's tough. Like I would say, if I could go back and do it again, if you know that there's fish there the day of the tournament and they're not biting, they're probably eventually going to bite. I would be hard pressed to leave an area that I know there's fish to go to an area and hope there's fish. 
Um, and I think that was the case. I went down south to Punta Gorda, where I kind of know there'd be some redfish and trout and put together, you know, piecemeal my day like I have in the past. And it was a grind and I got a red and a trout, but I was like seven or eight inches shy overall of winning because I didn't get that 35 inch red that made the difference. Um, mm. So definitely, I would say poke around and stay in an area that you know that there's fish. All you need is one bite. Could be a 10 second window, a one cast opportunity. But if you know, if you can see them, that's big. I keep thinking like, uh, I'm trying to remember your original question, but to answer it, it was, I'm very visual in my tournament approach. Um, and everywhere you fish is different. You know, in the Northwest and Northeast part of Florida, there might be some areas where the water's dirty and you might not be able to see fish as easy. And it's going to re require pre-fishing and hooking up in that area or off this point with current and, you know, looking at aerial maps. But for me, I am only making, when I'm fishing for reds or if I know there's big trout in an area, I'm only going to cast if I see fish. I'm going to be standing up and uh, how many areas do I cover when I'm out there? When it's trout fishing, it's a giant flat. I try to find a big open grass flat with little potholes and divots and little, little nuances. But when I'm fishing for redfish, I take my time and I poke around in areas that, you know, wind protected areas. I know Tony's talked about that a lot and that's huge. I find wind protected mangrove shorelines. I find thick, rich, lush grass is what I try to find. That's usually where I'm gonna find happy redfish that are slowing down. If you spend time and you sight fish, you look for the redfish and their, their peck fins are perfectly out and they're slowly moving. They're doing that because they're like, you know, scanning for abnormalities. They're just looking for a little shrimp in the grass as opposed to, uh, you know, redfish that are over sand or, or against an oyster bar. Um, they're, they're constantly on the move and they're patrolling and, and they respond a little bit differently than redfish over grass. That's, that's been the ticket for me. Um, so, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm very visually engaged, trying to find every fish that I'm going to catch instead of, um, you know, trout fishing, it's, it's blind casting most of the time, but for redfish and for snook too, uh, I'm not going to cast unless I know I see one. Because Straight up hunting. That's it, man. Stealthy. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what else, man? What are, what are some other, uh, other mistakes? I know, uh, you have your own little, what is it? Your equation is what you called it, right? Yeah, I've, I've actually said this in articles over the years. Uh, I've written a couple different articles about tournament fishing and, and uh, preparing and my success and talking about the day. And I really think that um, being successful on the water, whether it's in a tournament or not, it's a formula. And I think that success is preparation plus luck. And if you think about that, in that equation, only one of those things are within your control, and that's preparation. And so I would over obsess about preparation. Did I make sure that my uni to uni or my you know, leader to, to braid connection is perfect? Are my knots perfect? Did I pick the right color? Am I efficiently organized on my kayak to where I'm not cluttered and looking for something last minute? Sometimes I'll decide if I'm gonna change lures two or three or four different times, I keep those lures in the little like side rail of my kayak so that they're right there ready to go next to my pliers. And every single minute on the water, I remember, you know, there were times pedaling to the spot. I could, I could feel every heartbeat and every second of that tournament mattered. So I would prepare and make sure that any lures, my lip grippers, my net, oh man, if I, for every big trout I've hooked, uh, having a net is priceless. Oh my gosh, you need a good net to make sure that when you get that big 25 inch trout and he's shaking his head next to your kayak or your boat, you run the risk of losing that fish right there. That could be a $2,000 fish. You need to have a net to really quickly get it and secure it and make sure that it's safe. A rubber soft net to make sure it's safe on the fish too is big. Um, but yeah, I think success is preparation plus luck. You don't have control over luck, but you do have control over how much you prepare for things. And um, Joe, one thing I thought about, I, I, I've actually never, I've never talked to you about this, but um, in my, in my tournament endeavor time period, when I was, when I was doing really well and I would take first place, um, I, at first, I think I thought it might've been coincidence. And then I've thought about it over the years in depth. And I think this is, is something to, to make note of, um, is actually, I remember on my way to a spot that I fished in Mosquito Lagoon for a kayak fishing classics tournament. I've got a trophy back there. The first tournament I won with a little orange circle. I fished a biolab road and I went all the way to the east side of Mosquito Lagoon. I was in great shape. I had a much different mindset. I was super focused on, 
on being successful and my plan. And I actually, on my way pedaling to the spot, I prayed and I had a conversation with God and I didn't, I didn't ask to win. I, I didn't want that. What I wanted is I wanted some clarity and I wanted the opportunity to be at my best. And I remember having that conversation out loud, pedaling to the spot saying, you know, please help me uh, be the best that I can be and have a clear mind and clear focus and perform at the best of my abilities. Uh, you know, not for anything special, but just to allow me to, to be the best that I can be. And I've noticed um, that in every time that I have had that moment and, and, and had that conversation that I have, I've done well. I think I've won almost every single one. Wow. And initially I didn't think too much about it, but you know, over the years and as I got older, I realized that there's something to be said about that, to have faith and to have trust in yourself and, and trust in things that might be out of your control, but maybe you're within your control or, or within you the whole time. So a lot of it is, is faith and trust in yourself and your abilities and, and knowing that you can go out there and, and you can be successful is huge. Um, it's not, it's not ego. It's, it's, uh, it's humble confidence. Um, so I, I never share that with you, but that's something that's awesome. that, uh, yeah, I, I really think that that's, that's something that, you know, that it's, it's within everybody. So um, just a little, little token to keep in your back pocket. I love it, dude. So yeah. let's, let's keep going down that path a little bit. It, Cause that's about, that's kind of about mindset. It's about you use the word trust. There's also days and I'm sure you've had them. We've all had them on the water where you just, you, you go out there with the right mindset and you know, you, you just know it's going to be a great day. And all of a sudden it's not. And now let's just say it's term of day and it's 10 30, it's 11. You still don't have a fish on the board. What, like, this is where people usually collapse. Yeah. Right. You, you do like even worse than Hail Mary, you just completely throw everything out the door and the window and you're just like a loose cannon. Like give some tips there and, and not just term of day, but any given time just for staying cool, calm, collected, going back to the plan. And uh, what, what are the mindset tips that you have oh, on when it gets tough? It's easy to have good mindset when things are going great. It's easy to give praise to God and all that when things are going great, but it's when the tough times it's, it can be a little bit tougher. Yeah. Nobody comes out of the woodwork and is just, and just has the golden hand and does well from the very beginning. People do well from failure. You learn from your experiences. And there have been a, a couple tournaments where I grinded for days pre-fishing different areas and struggling to get a bite. Or maybe I had a great time pre-fishing and then the day of the tournament, you know, I'd see a 28 inch fish, a big red fish. I flip my bait to it. I set the hook and I get nothing but clean fluorocarbon back, no hook, no lure. And I'm looking at this fish with a plastic in its mouth and I lost my opportunity or I've broken rods. I've broken my mirage drive in the first hour of a tournament. And it's incredibly discouraging knowing that I'm at a serious disadvantage to do well. And I remember there were probably one or two tournaments that I just was in a really poor mental state and didn't pick myself back up and keep grinding. And over the years, I learned that you, you have to take a beat take a breath and tell yourself that even if you don't do well in this tournament, you should make the most out of it because you don't know what you're going to learn in those final moments. And, and that might be the thing that'll help you do well in the next tournament. Everything is a learning experience. You know, you keep your chin up, you take a deep breath and you push through it and you try to keep a clear mind about yourself when you're overly stressed on the water and there's all these different things going on the wind is in your face or it's going to start storming or whatever something's going to happen it's a tournament you just have to acknowledge that you're not alone in that everybody else on the water that you're not allowed to communicate with could be going through these things that you're going through or worse and um, you may very well if you just keep a clear head about yourself i try to take a beat I take a breath, I stop everything that I'm doing and I reassess and say, what's my next move here? You know, yeah, nothing's been going great for me, but I, I still got three hours left and you never know. I may end up getting an 18 inch trout that I don't think twice about, but it, it gets me fifth place. You have no idea what everyone else is going through on the water and you should just focus on giving your best effort, grinding it out and, and feeling, feeling good about it. You know, you're still fishing. It's, it's not the end of the world if it's rough. Love it, dude. Yeah. Well, man, super helpful. This, uh, this was a really good podcast. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, obviously, if you made it this far, then you, you love it. But, uh, you know, you talked about tournaments. Some people like, oh, I don't want to do tournaments. And I, I hope there's a lot of people that listen to this and still listen all the way through 
because you drop some like bombs, some gems on just going out there and being consistent and doing well, good days, bad days, bad tides, wind, all the stuff that we always have to, you know, compete with as, uh, as anglers. So that was super, super helpful. Uh, real quick too, if you like Justin, you like everything you've heard, one really cool thing that we're now doing with our Insider members, we had a, a it was really the next level of membership called the Inner Circle. And it was invitation only. It was a, a small group of a few hundred people. And we were meeting once a week on Thursdays uh, on a call, on a Zoom call, uh, kind of like this. And just to go over everything that's working right now and, and really just open it up for live Q&A. Like, and we have people say, hey, I'm not necessarily tournament fishing, but hey, I'm going to be fishing in this area this weekend. What do you guys recommend? We actually get on maps and, and it, it would be like full-time fishing guy just being there in your back pocket, showing you exactly where to go fishing, what to concentrate on, what's working right now. Incredibly valuable. And it's, we talk about all the time, like if you want to get good at anything, you get coaching, you hire a coach, you get a network, right? This is about networking and, uh, and coaching kind of combined. And now we're doing that every week for our insider members. This is something free. It used to be 97 bucks a month, just FYI, to be part of this. And we're giving it free to insider members right now, we're doing it every single Thursday. And, uh, and of course we recorded if you can't make it and it's so valuable. And Justin's on these calls now. And to me, I think it's one of the most important parts of what we're doing. It's, uh, it's how you leapfrog all your friends. It's how you leapfrog people who are in tournaments. And uh, to me, it's priceless. It's the, it's the network plus, plus coaching and uh, equals you, you catch more fish. Success? You, you, yeah. yeah, success. You become more consistent. <laughs> so uh, definitely, definitely please join us if you haven't already. And of course, if you're a member, you can find some details out inside the community where we have the link for the Zoom call every single week. And then all the lures like the Slam Shady Bomber and Miradines, everything we talked about here is at fishstrong.com. That's fishstrong.com. We got them. We got got them. And it has been tough. And we we appreciate your patience. I know it seems like daily we still get emails from people saying, hey, you guys are out of this and you don't have this reel, this rod. Uh, it, It has been so challenging. It has been so tough with COVID. Know that it's not us. Like we're more frustrated than anyone. We have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of pending orders like we're trying to give them our money yeah probably like you're saying to us and it's just it's been such a challenge but it's getting better slowly but surely and uh and just know that we are trying we are working on this every single day for you but all that can be found at fishstrong.com where of course our members one more reason to become an insider member get 20 percent off everything in the store and it's proprietary yeah. products now like blackout chum and the power oh, prawns power and- prawn yeah Ooh. for sure Woo. cool brother that was so good anything else no just you know i love doing this with you I'm, I'm happy we could bring some light to it and uh and reach out to us with questions guys we yep. love we love helping you if we can um helping guide you to be more successful that that brings us a lot of joy and that's what it's all about it's about camaraderie and community and helping one another be better so um super looking forward to talking with you guys and let us know if you have questions comment comment on this and keep us posted Yep, we love the comments and definitely do it at saltstrong.com under the fishing tips section. That's where all the comments come directly to us, where if it's on Facebook, YouTube, sometimes they come to us, sometimes they don't. That whole social media, yeah, Yeah. it's a little bit crazy out there. But we always get every single comment that comes to saltstrong.com. Just find this exact blog post. You might even be listening or watching on there right now. And at the very bottom, you'll see a place to comment. It comes directly to us. So guys, thank you so much. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. And if you're listening on iTunes or Stitcher, please subscribe. Leave us a review. It helps out big time. And of course, join us in the Insider Club, 20,000 plus strong. We've got some really cool stuff coming. This whole inner circle, this private coaching and network uh, event that we're doing every single Thursday now has just been game changing. And I can't wait to see you guys on some of those live calls. Otherwise, we are out. And we'll talk to you on the next episode. Peace. See ya.